Welcome back to the Crash the Pond podcast. It is a Monday, January 22nd edition of the podcast, and we've got plenty to talk about. Ducks hockey, Ducks Ducks season. Yeah, I feel like this... I think this is the first week where it's been... It feels like... It feels like the first time in a while that there's not a whole lot to talk about that is specifically positive, I guess, is the best way to put it. Um... We're coming off two weeks of being able to talk about the Drysdale for Gautier. Uh, Go- God, I am going to just continue to script that name. Gautier trade. Um, and we came off kind of a fun week last week with the exciting win over the Florida Panthers. Uh, you had the news of Trevor Zegers and your, sure, your 49ers winning. Will you put that away now after after last episode? Um, it's good luck now. And then this week, since we last recorded, the Ducks have lost three games. And to the Washington Capitals, to the San Jose Sharks, and last night to the New York Rangers. And each of them are kind of different in what happened in the game. And some of it, I mean, I guess the Sharks game is the only one you could really search for some positives in. But the positives are kind of outweighed by uh, the negatives of you're playing the San Jose Sharks. And so I think this was the first just really frustrating week. Yeah, I think that the... The thing I'm going to try to illustrate on this podcast okay. that I want to talk about at least is I think yeah. that right now Greg Cronin is kind of forcing a system onto this team that just is not working. And it hasn't been working for a, a while now. And we've just reached a point where I think the the game against the Rangers just kind of fully illustrated how Yes, the Rangers are a great transition team. They're also not a great five-on-five team, though. And the Rangers just really, really exposed a glaring weakness in the system, among others. And I think it's just time to take stock a little bit of where we're at with with Greg Cronin. Yeah, I mean, so you've mentioned that in our Discord bunch. And you've brought up uh, the article that Patrick uh, put out there, which I read way back when but it's been a while since I refreshed it and haven't had a chance to look at it again. But why don't you just kind of, for both my sake and for the listener's sake, when you're talking about kind of diving into the system and it's not working, what do you mean specifically with the system? Are you talking about the defensive zone structure with the man-to-man system, or are you more so talking about breaking into the offensive zone, uh, those types of things uh, within? And what are you seeing specifically that are not working to just relay to everyone? I really wish I had like a whiteboard right now. That would make this a lot easier to illustrate. Okay. But so well, that doesn't work for audio listeners, though. No, no. But for all <laughs> for all of our fr- our best friends that are in here. But just to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. So right now, what the Ducks do is when they are forechecking their offensive zone forecheck. I think that their their forecheck is killing them. Their forecheck is the thing that is causing them so many problems, and. It's exacerbating some of the weaknesses of their own players, but it's also putting their own players in really bad positions. So what do I mean? The Ducks are just just close your eyes, everyone. If you're listening, if you're close watching my eyes, close your eyes. And I just want so you to pick, if you're on the podcast with you, pick picture a hockey rink, picture five on five, picture Ducks versus pick your other NHL team. Ducks are trying to enter the offensive zone. They dump the puck in puck goes deep. Puck goes below the goal line. The first forward, the the forward closest to the puck, typically the one who dumped it in, the F1, they go and pressure the puck carrier below the goal line. They chase it all the way to really get on that guy who is going to be nearest to the puck, the, the opponent. The F2, the second forward, the one who's the second closest to the puck, they're going directly to the closest possible passing option. So what happens is you have your first forward who's below the goal line, and typically you have your second forward who's also in the face-off circle area or in the slot area. Mm -hmm. So let's just to recap this part of it, puck gets dumped in, first forward goes and tries to pressure the puck, second forward is already on top of the next potential option. The problem is the F3, the third forward, is also a lot of the times getting below, sometimes below the goal line, but in that face-off circle area. And so what happens is, freeze frame, you have three forwards all in the same area, all in that, you know, that, that last third of the offensive zone. And if a team recovers it, 
and chips it out or does a stretch pass, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's an odd man rush every single time. And yesterday the, the New York Rangers did a great job of picking up on that right away stretch passes. They had forwards awaiting in the neutral zone. And what happens is then you, you have, you're making your forwards have to skate back, get on their horse each time. And it's just an exhausting way to play. When you recover the puck, the logic is it creates turnovers, it creates possession, but teams have picked up on it and they're picking up on it more and more. It happened even against the Sharks. Freaking Mark Edward Vlasic scored a goal off the rush getting into the slot. And by the rush, I don't, it's, it's not necessarily a catch all term, but it's in this specific instance where you've tried to, to dump it in or, or possess it for check, puck comes back your way. So that right there, if I were to just pick one thing, is just killing the Ducks right now. And there's been no adjustment from Greg Cronin in this hyper, hyper aggressive uh, for checking scheme. Yeah, that's, and that's my issue with Greg Cronin. One of my issues with Greg. Well, Cronin. so I, I guess kind of to now, as you've kind of really in a good way, eloquently put kind of the main issue with the system, right? Of And I'm trying to recall, there was a game earlier on in the season and part of me almost wants to say that against the Kings, but I'm not sure if it was against LA. But there was a team that was just recognized it and started just going with a high flip. Yep. And I can't remember what team it was for the life of me, but it was it really noticeable. The quite a bit. It may have been the Avalanche then that I'm yeah. thinking of that they went for that high flip and uh, to break through that pressure and get chances going the other way. Um, and so I, I guess to now turn this into a, another side of this, right? Identified an issue, right? That you're seeing that you think is causing them a, a problem. What's the solution? Well, so I think one, if you look at Corey, uh, Corey Schneider's tracking data, mm -hmm. you know, caveats on sample size, but the Ducks dump the puck in quite a bit. So this is a mm -hmm. deliberate thing to me that they're doing where they want to play that Greg Cronin hockey, smash mouth, dump it in, go and get it, pressure everyone, suffocate the opposition. And when you've got fresh legs and when you've got a team that has the legs and the, the, just the horses to go and do it, it looks great. You know, we've seen it around the league. I feel like this is something we've seen the avalanche do the carolina hurricanes do the problem is if you don't have the horses it's going to look ugly and so i think that right now on this offensive zone four check either you dump the puck in less on entry so let's look for more controlled zone entries because when that happens then you you don't create this the situation that i'm talking about so just look for more controlled zone entries or particularly that third forward so not the one pressuring the puck on the dump in. Let's get back to our imaginary hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Not the first forward pressuring the puck. Maybe not even the second forward who's on the next closest man. But that third forward, let's just keep him a little higher. Instead of him being low in the face-off circle area, let's keep him between the face-off circles and the blue line. That way he can kind of see the field, see what's going on, adjust wherever the puck's going to go. But also if the puck gets quick, you know, quick upped, he can already be there to adjust and at least just even up the numbers. Give those two other two more time to come back. Because if it's three guys down low each time, they're all three having a scramble. So if there were just one adjustment, it would be let's keep that third forward a little higher, lower, whatever you want to call it, closer to the blue line or just go full on passive. But I don't think that's how Greg Cronin wants to play. Yeah. And so now I'm just kind of looking at the, the Corey numbers also because he has his uh, team comparison tools where you mm -hmm. can actually look up both offensively and defensively and looking at zone entries. And so the Ducks actually are one of the higher teams in getting zone entries per 60. But one of the biggest issues that they've had so far is making sure that they have controlled entries, which means first off, they're either dumping it or losing it on a turnover um, and getting entries leading to chances and or four check pressures, which kind of tells me that, oh, and sorry, carry in percentage. They, they are significantly below, which goes to your point of they're not carrying it in much. They are dumping the puck in. And the thing is, they're not recovering that many entries. Uh, yep. For a team that's dumping the puck in as much as they are, they're about average in terms of recovered entries per 60. And you would expect to see that higher if you're a team that's dumping it in. And so I think it's all, I, I think one thing to, that I want to bring up though, to kind of add to your point, right? I think that's a good solution of keeping the, the third floor checker a little bit higher. But I also think just a little bit more recognition if you are going to run this on the F1 and how they're coming in to try to disrupt play. Because I think that there is way too much of, uh, and it's funny because it kind of goes anti to Greg Cronin's methodology and uh, comments, but there's way too much of just trying to get the uh, a body on a man. Yep. And there was there was a prime example of it in last night's game where Ross Johnston dumps the, or I don't know if he dumps it, someone dumps the puck into the zone. 
and the puck ends up squeezing through the Rangers uh, defend defender that is below the blue line, and Ross Johnston is coming in, and he would have had a straight line to that puck, and for whatever reason, he got so focused on the man that he went for the hit when he would have been able to get the puck and not have pressure on him underneath the goal line, and instead of doing that, he went for the body, the Rangers get the puck, and they end up breaking it out clean, going the other way. And it's just a prime example of you can't be focused on like I feel like everyone thinks about a four check dump and chase chase offense, which personally I'm not the biggest fan of. But if you're going to do it, you have to be good at getting pucks back and retrieving pucks. But everyone kind of thinks about you have to play physical in order to do that. It's not about necessarily being physical. It's about getting pucks back. It's about winning puck battles. It's about creating 50 50 battles that you go in and win. It's not about creating a hit because. At the end of the day, those types of hits from Ross Johnston don't win puck battles back. The guy has already released the puck. The puck is no longer there. You're not trying to separate the man from the puck in that situation. Um, and, and so you need to make sure that you are doing something there that can end up getting the puck back more. And uh, not here for likes in our YouTube chat. Just said, Randy Carl loved dump and chase, so he hates it now. Um, the one thing that I'll say on that, the reason why I personally don't love a dump and chase system, it doesn't really have to do with Randy Carlisle. It's just more so, I guess, it's an aesthetic thing. I think mm-hmm. more be- like more beautiful offense is created off of zone entries. You have more highly skilled plays that are created off of clean and zone entries. You also just, there. there's some statistics around it that you have a better chance of scoring a goal off a clean zone entry because you're not giving the puck up. Yep. And the thing is, it takes skill to be able to do that. And so... I think that that is one thing I wish um, I wish this team would do is stop dumping it in as much. I think part of it is, and this is, I guess, my question overall, is this actually what Greg Cronin want, wants the team to play or how he wants the team to play? Or is this more of a symptom of the situation that they're in with guys being injured? I think they've been playing this way the entire year. I, I don't think that this is okay. anything. This well, is anything, and the new. numbers the numbers do bear that out. But I but they've been hurt for most of the year. I guess is my I think point I of. think now. I mean, here's the reality. Mm-hmm. Now you've lost Trevor Zegers, and you basically only have one line. Yeah, and, and Leo Carlson with Troy Terry insert winger, who are actually gaining the zone with control. Yep. When you have Trevor, also. when you have Trevor Zegers, you potentially have two lines that can do that. Mm-hmm. But now when you have three lines playing this this dump and chase style, because I don't really think that the first line plays that way on the four check, although nope. I think Leo Carlson, he will dump the puck, but he'll put it in these kind of soft, advantageous areas for the I, winger to go get it. I also think that he will get the zone before doing a chip. I don't think it's a straight like yeah. dump in from yeah, yeah. the neutral zone. It's, it's different than your standard dump and chase. He's a lot more judicious with it. Yes. Um, but yeah, so what happens is you now have this McTavish for Toronto Strom line, which has been a bit of a constant even when Zegers is healthy, but they are playing that style quite a bit and they get burned like every game. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it happens every single game that they go into four check, they get beat out clean and it turns into an odd man rush the other way and someone screws up and it's, it's a stressful position to be in. Like when you're having to backtrack because you're already behind the eight ball, you're going to be prone to mistakes because it yeah. you have you have like five seconds to solve the puzzle. And if you don't solve the puzzle, it's potentially going to change the score of the game. So there's that. There's also the fact that clearly like those three guys just don't really seem to be on the same page that often when they're backtracking, trying to solve this situation. But it's also just a stressful position to be in. And so when you have three lines really playing that way, it's not going to create advantages at least it hasn't, right? It's. I'm not saying that the actual system itself can't work because clearly it does work around, you know, it and, has worked for other teams. And we have seen it work with this team at various points in time also. But, I, but it's not working right now. It hasn't worked for a long time, if we're being honest. And it's like, what's, like, what interest is being served trying to just play this way? Like, I know that Greg Cronin wants to play a certain way. You know, him and Paverby clearly believe in kind of this physical, hard to play against hockey but it's not working in their favor right now. It's costing them games. Like it, it's against the Rangers. It cost them the game. I yeah, don't think I, that's hyperbole. I would say there's one line that I think is do, playing this system well right now. And that is not even the first line because I think you're spot on. I don't think the first line necessarily play necessarily plays this four checking system. No, 
I I think that the Lundestrom, Silverberg, Leeson line, I think that they do deserve credit because I think they are doing a good yep. job of getting in, making smart plays on pucks to cause turnovers. And if you look at the numbers for these last two games against the Sharks and against the Rangers, it's really like it, it's a stark contrast between those that line and the Carlson line and then the McTavish line and the Carrick line. Those mm-hmm. uh it, the those two lines are just at least at 50% or better in terms of expected goal share. If you look at the McTavish line, they're at like almost 0%. And same thing for the Carrick line. They are just getting absolutely shelled and not getting anything for. And so I guess anything else that you want to talk about with the system, because that's actually a transition point for me of what do you do with this team right now? Because well, here's, some- here, here's the other problem. Okay. So if you are playing this system yep. on the, on the four check, specifically the offensive zone four check. So you're asking a lot of your players and that's fine. Like they're world, they're world-class athletes. Yeah. It's, it's normal to ask a lot of them physically, but when you're also asking them to play this man on man style in the D zone where you're having to do a lot more skating, it's a lot more taxing. It's a lot more physical you know, you, it's kind of hard to just keep up the pace because you have to be physical everywhere. And I was listening to the, the PDO cast today, mm-hmm. and I thought that Jack Hahn actually made an interesting point, which is that the rule of thumb is that his rule of thumb in kind of like D zone and, and four checking is that if you're going to be aggressive in one, you want to be less aggressive in the other, right? You want to have some sort of balance in your game because it's just think about it logically. If you're just running around all the time, it's just hard to keep up. It's hard to think. It's hard to just kind of play the game. And so I think that if you're not going to change this forward checking, maybe it's time to, you know, get more passive in the D zone, go to more of a zone or flip it around and go more of a passive forward check and keep your man to man. But something's got to give somewhere to just kind of let these players breathe a little bit, because mm-hmm. I think like both literally and figuratively let them breathe. Cause I think like looking at Mason McTavish, the last couple games, like, He's made some really good plays in the D zone when he's kind of more of like to use like a, a football or basketball term, like a ball hawk, when he's just kind of hanging out in the slot, not really covering anyone, but just going to wherever the threat is. Like there was the one against the Rangers where obviously mm-hmm. he scooped up the puck off the goal line, but he had other plays where he did that really well. And so like, let's just tap into these players strengths because I don't, I don't think the, the, the ducks are necessarily as bad as they're showing right now. And maybe I'm just going to die on that optimistic hill, but I, I believe it. Well, and I think even the numbers show that there are breakdowns that are happening within the within the system, but there are there are positives that can be taken away from their play. Yeah. Um, but where I was going to go with that is, I think one thing someone mentioned this actually in our YouTube chat. M said, "Can you tailor a, di- a system around different lines, or does it have to be streamlined?" I think you can. Like, yeah. I think you can make it work for each line, and I think that that's probably where you have to go because, I mean, let the Leo line continue what they're doing. It's working. It's working at an extremely high rate, both from a production standpoint and from a chance perspective. Like that line is getting like this is not like a situation early on in the season or things like that where we could point to the McTavish line getting the production and be like, okay, this might be a little bit higher than it should be. Like the Carlson line is generating all of the chances for the Ducks right now, and they are getting rewarded for it with goals. Like that is that is what's happening. This is not a, a one off. They're getting lucky type of deal. This is. Carlson, Terry, Henrique, all going very, very well right now, which is great for the Ducks for trade value for Adam Henrique. But you can also then have the Lundestrom line continue what they're doing because they are playing a like that is your ideal fourth line for this team when everyone is healthy. Is that line where not a whole lot's necessarily gonna happen with them on the ice, but they're not they're going to be in the offensive zone more than the defensive zone. They're gonna be solid when they're in their own D zone, and they're gonna be able to chip in with some chances here and there, like. That is your ideal fourth line for this team is that line right there. And then I think the second line, I think they're, or this is actually what I was more so thinking, but, or what you do outside of that, because yes, you would have to change things up for the McTavish line because defensive zone is just a mess for them right now. It it is a complete mess. (laughs) I I felt like in the last game, the the penalty that McTavish took in the third just because oh, yeah. it, directly off of like just complete miscommunication. Yeah. And like I that one's not his fault completely. There was a mishap with the defense, but still it's just emblematic of things. And I feel like after what you did the the breakdown of McTavish's game against the Panthers, right? Um was it against the Panthers? I yes. think. Um but I find myself in the defensive zone just watching McTavish more and more away from the puck. 
And there are just so many times where it looks like he's just, um, where he's just kind of floating. He's not yeah. really around anyone. He's just kind of covering an area on the ice, and that's not that sis- the system that they're supposed to be playing in the D zone. It's you're almost like to... they're they're asking him to do something different than everyone else. Like it's but it's hard to understand. I don't think it is. I think he's just not understanding things correctly <laughs> with that. Um, and so, and, and the fourth line is just bad. Like the fourth line just needs to get broken up. Ross Johnson should not be in the lineup at all. Like I've, I know you've been there for a while. I've been there, but he's there's some things that have shown he's been all right, but that's more so being driven completely by Jack when Jacob Silverberg was on his line. Like that was that Jacob Silverberg driving that line. So Ross Johnson just has no business being in the lineup at this point in time. Make it McGinn, Carrick, Grew if you want. Call up Pavel Agenda. Call up Chase DeLeo. Call up anyone. Ross Johnson should not be in this lineup at this point in time. I'm planting my flag there at this. It took me a while to finally get to that point. But it's also on Cronin. No, it is. It 100% is. But I I guess, sorry, this was where I wanted to go originally, though. I think there are changes that have to happen to this lineup. I think the Carlson line should stay where it's at. But I think the McTavish line needs an adjustment because Vetrano and Strom are just not what Mason McTavish needs at this point in time. I think earlier on in the season, it felt like he was understanding things, putting things in the right way. Whereas whether you want to say it's confidence, whether you want to say it's poor play, however you want to put it, he looks lost out there in the D zone and needs someone out there with him that is going to kind of help carry him and help put him in better positions than Vetrano and Strom do. And so I wonder what your thoughts are on essentially putting, I mean, they ran this line in, I think it was the Tampa game, but doing something like a Lundestrom McTavish Silverberg. Wow. Where you're maybe losing a lot of offensive pop there. Yeah. But you're negating a massive defense the defensive deficiency. Well, this team is in a terrible spot right now. Just from a lineup construction Correct. perspective. Like Correct. you really only have one true kind of like known quantity line, which is Correct. putting Bill Carlson and Troy Terry together. Correct. Right now they have Adam Henrique on that line. He's scoring. He looks yep. predictably great next to and two he, great and, playmakers. And, and you could put McTavish there, but I would not do that. Keep Adam Henrique there to boost his trade value. Don't modify that. If you break up the Toronto Strom McTavish, the thing is, as a as a team, then where is the offense going to come from? Because the offense is not like I'm going to go on a, on a big limb here and say the offense is not going to come from a McTavish Silverberg Lundestrom line. So Don't hit on Jacob Silverberg, but yes. hey, he's been you playing are, great, but he, like, I know offense I know. has not been his calling card. No. No. Those twenty, those twenty goal seasons are are long gone. Um, yeah. So, but I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I don't hate the idea in a perfect world, but right now the Ducks are just in a bind where they kind of almost have to play these guys together because they're gonna. I mean, they're gonna get them goals, and I mean they need those too. So I don't know. It's I mean, a very, if, it's a difficult position. I mean, what if you move Embrink stuff, move Strom off that line and put Silverberg there? Just to give some, I, I think making one tweak there just to get some better defensive uh, response, somebody that can give you a little bit more there defensively than what yeah. Strom and Vetrano do. That might be the play. I mean, also, I just think you need to change what, I mean, it, this goes back to the original point, which is that you need to just change what you're asking of Mason McTavish on the four check. Like, like his strength to me is as a, as a center bearing down, the, the neutral zone, carrying the puck in and creating a play go, or, you know, doing a give and go asking him to be this kind of like meat and potatoes for checker. Like I get it. He has a beard. I get it. He's big and powerful, but like, that's not his game. Can, can we move past this kind of stereotyping of Mason McTavish? Like he's yeah. a, he's a, he's a skilled, intelligent player. And I just think right now he's, he's kind of not being allowed to, you know, unfurl or spread his wings. It, it, it's, it's chicken or the egg, right? Because I agree with you that he's doing a lot of things that don't, are not helping the team. He's also doing a lot of things that are helping offensively. And the skill and the Agreed. playmaking, it, it's all still there. It's just the, the the window for it to come out is just a lot smaller game to game. And I think that like at a, I mean, certain, point, at a certain point, you got to change what you're asking him to do. I'd be curious to... It... If there are any recent games, now we're just kind of spitballing and free flowing with this. But I wonder if there are any recent games with McTavish where he has uh, entered the puck 
I guess with dump ins more often than, than with a controlled zone entry. Cause I'm looking at his track data, which grants is only 134 minutes, uh, five on five time on ice. So relatively small sample size because Corey can only do so much. He's also, um, how many minutes has he actually played this season? Like, I think probably like 400 would be my guess mm-hmm. off yeah. the top of my head, but he control, he does a controlled entry. So as in, when I say that, that means carrying the puck in more often than average. Like that, it, that is something that he does more often than dumping it in. And I feel like he ha- is not doing that as much lately. I feel like he is dumping it in more, which yep. is maybe one of the reasons why he is not finding as much success. And to your point, the reason why they're getting counterattacked a whole lot more than you saw in previous iterations for that line, because even though we were critical of that line, this feels like the worst stretch that they've had defensively. Like this well, feels like yeah. above and beyond where they were at earlier in the season with allowing chances against. But I do want to give them, <clears throat> I do want to give them some benefit of the doubt because I think that Cronin is just not helping them out at all. Like I think yeah. that he, he's asking them to do things that it, like, this is just not in their nature. It's not, it, that's not the kind of players that they are. You know, Brian Strom is a very methodical crafty playmaker when he's at his best you know frank vetrano is maybe your kind of buzzsaw four checker but that's really it like i don't think mctavish is that guy and that's okay that's perfectly fine um they're all bad four checkers actually looking at the data <laughs> like but, but, so, I, but so well yeah because because the way that the way that they're four checking is not working like i'm right. not saying that they can't be good four checkers but being this kind of smash mouth four checker who's just dumping it in and just go straight to the guy like that doesn't work for these guys um you know Dumping it in, maybe taking an angle, being a bit more cautious, just taking ice away, that probably is going to be better for them when they're in those scenarios. But when I listened to Greg Cronin in the post-game interview yesterday, you know, talking about how New York adjusted and started, you know, I think he said punting pucks, you know, up ice, beating their forecheck. And he's like, oh, yeah, that was really interesting. I'm like, yeah, Greg, teams have been doing that to you all season. <laughs> <laughs> like they're just, they have the skill to do it a lot more and they picked up on it right away and just kind of spammed that button. Like it's like you're playing super smash brothers. And when the other player just figures out a button combo and just keeps smashing it until you figure something out, that's what happened. And he never really adjusted. And it's like, yeah, Greg teams have been doing that too all year. Yeah. It's great. And- it's great. It's great that you realized it now, but like it, it's time to adjust. It's time yeah. to adjust. And speaking of adjustments, You can make an adjustment to your eating habits with our sponsor of this episode, Green Chef. You can elevate your your everyday wellness with the number one meal kit for clean eating and discover new gut-friendly recipes each week. Green Chef delivers whole food for your whole body. We're committed to, or they're committed to providing a holistic approach to nutrition by offering meals that contribute to the overall well-being of your entire body. Choosing Green Chef means choosing real wholesome foods that don't just fill you up, but also support a healthy lifestyle. It's more than just satisfying hunger. It's about feeling good with every bite. And you can embark on a delicious culinary adventure this year with their diverse menu. Each week, choose from 80 plus flavor flavor packed options. Easily customize your meals to suit your lifestyle with preferences like keto, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, gluten free and protein packed. Uh, Green Chef offers unique farm fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies and premium proteins. You can let Green Chef take the work out of eating clean with their chef-crafted, nutritionist-approved recipes featuring certified organic fruits, vegetables, organic cage-free eggs, and sustainably sourced seafood. With Green Chef, you can count on meals that are good for your taste buds, good for your body, and good for the planet. And if you're looking to stock up on functional stacks, snacks and clean beverages to support your gut and brain health this January, head to Green Market and shop their new green bundles, a curated selection of unique hand-picked goods that support your overall wellness goals. The Green Market is the mindful eater's one-stop shop for high-quality, careful, curated goods. And I mean, I've talked about this a bunch, right? Green Chef's great. They've been kind enough to send us some boxes. And every single time they do, the recipes that they send you, the nice little cards that they give you, obviously they send you all of the ingredients there. You just take it out, you prepare. It. It's a fun little date night, fun little night with with you and the family. If you're on your own, it gives you plenty of food to eat on your own also that will uh, do a little meal prep for you. But you can keep those cards after the fact. And it gives you a nice recipe that you can have. There was a bangers and mash that I've done, a shepherd's pie. Everything I've ever gotten from there is absolutely delicious, and I would not, I cannot recommend it enough. And so you can go to greenchef.com slash 60CTP 
and use the code 60CTP to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. So once again, go to greenchef.com slash 60CTP and use code 60CTP to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. Uh, that's once again, thank you so much to Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Wow, that was your best uh Thank you. Your best thank segue. You. Thank you. That was your best I, I had a different one lined up, and then you went on the Cronin rant, and I was like, oh, this one's better. Clean, you know, methodical, decisive. Yeah, yeah. You know, thank just you. Unlike the Ducks uh, system right now. Wow, there you go. <laughs> um, there you go. But I think we and, should probably talk about Alex Kalorn at this point. Yep. He kind of is buried the out. Lead. Yeah, he had, what, arthroscopic knee surgery? Yes. And so he will be out four to six weeks. Is that correct? Or is it just straight six? I'm trying to record. Four to six. Four to six. Four to six weeks. And so by the sounds of it from the broadcast, this sounded like something that had been nagging him for a little bit, maybe even going back to early on in the season. And for whatever reason, him and Ducks management picked now to do it. Uh, I think you and I both have our, not conspiracy theories, but our theories behind why they did it right now. Uh, Do you want to go into yours? I think mine agrees with yours, though. Well, I'm no doctor. I hate that like people say that to like couch their bad medical opinions because it's like, yeah, we know you're not a yeah. doctor. Um, but to reiterate, I I am not a doctor. I don't claim to understand injuries very well, but it seems to me like this procedure is not well. It's, it's arthroscop- arthroscopic, so it's not very invasive. We don't know how much pain he was necessarily in, how much discomfort he was necessarily in. He practiced the day before this was announced. Mm -hmm. Um, He was playing on the top line. He was playing well also. This seems like something that may have been bugging him, and they kind of just decided, you know what? Why don't you go get that done now? It won't necessarily hurt us in the short term because the season's kind of, you know, like from a competitive standings point of view, the season's kind of, going down the drain anyway. Why don't you go get that done? Four to six weeks, it's not... Or is it four to six or six to eight? Four to six. I'm staring at it right now. Okay, because Google says six to eight is the standard timeline for this. So nope. interesting. But Next website says four to six. But regardless, um, it's not it's not ending his season. Like, you know, there's still going to be plenty of games left when he, when he gets back. Um, but it does kind of feel to me like... It feels like a white flag. In a way, like a like a small white flag, like not the big white flag, but like a mini white flag of like, you know what? We are now choosing to have our top top line players, our highly paid players go and get surgeries instead of chasing points, which we all knew where we all knew that this is where the ducks were at. But this is kind of them removing all doubt. Again, this is all just my own opinion. It could completely be wrong. He could have been in a lot of pain. Like yeah. there's, there's definitely another side to this, but that's just kind of what this seems like. The thing I would add there that I think is also something important is I, I think you're spot on that. I think this could be viewed as Pat Verbeek uh, waving the white, white flag on the little, towel, little Throw bit, the damn towel. but not fully because here, here's where I'll come at it from. I think that if this is something that was bugging him and they figured that he would need it anyways, and they were trying to figure out when, um, when was the best time to do this? Do you wait till after the season? Then you don't have a full off season. Do you wait a couple months and then you do it and then he misses that the last 20 games of the season or however many games are in that four to six week range? Um, when, when is the optimal time? And so if you look at the Ducks roster right now, right, there's Minchikov's out, Zegris is out, Jones is out, uh, Labushkin's out. There, there are still a, a slew of injuries on this Ducks roster. And so if you want to kind of have a good idea of what your team is, you want all these guys to get healthy around the same time. And so I think if you're looking at it, the Ducks are prioritizing the final about 20 games of the season, which is right around the time Zegers will be back with this team and Cutter Gauthier will also be joining the team. And so Alex Kalorn being four to six weeks, and I think it's about two weeks since Zegers got hurt. So he'll be back right around the same time Zegers is. This is Pat Verbeek saying, okay, I'd much rather sacrifice right now and have everyone healthy for that final 20 games so I can really see what I have during that stretch. I don't think it's necessarily waving the white flag on the season as much as it is prioritizing everyone healthy at the same time to end the season. Yeah, I mean, also, 
again, it's just an acknowledgement that chasing points at yeah. the expense of like guys playing through pain or whatever, which does happen. Yep. Like I think that that's one of the underrated things about teams that w- have a lot of success regular season and playoffs is guys just playing through stuff. Um, but right now, I mean, the Ducks have the third best odds to get the first overall pick, which kind of sucks that we're already talking about that in January, but it is what it is. Just kind of embrace it. There could be some losing here in the next you know, month or so, month and a half. They, but what I will say is that it's not full on like last year, you know, tank watch where you just want to, lo- I mean, yes, maybe deep down, if you're a Ducks fan who wants a high pick, you want to lose every game, but at least we have Leo Carlson and Troy Terry to watch. Yeah. Like, like there are still, there, there are still like, there's still a franchise player kind of just being born before our eyes. And so it's not like last year where like games are just straight up unwatchable and like everything's and- lost. Yeah, and I think there's still progress that can be had. And I think things you can look for. I think obviously that I think they've done a better job of late with penalties and not taking as many. Uh, they're still getting burned on the penalty kill, which is not great. But at least discipline seems like it's becoming a, a better thing for this team of late. But I think that if they can clean up some things with that second line and if it can find some better play, they're going to find themselves in games. And so I think... Seeing this team trend upwards is what I want to see. And so as of right now, um, you're seeing their expected goal share go up and up and up. They're still in the like bottom 20 of this uh, or bottom 10 of the league. But they were at one point in time like 29th or 28th, and they've gone up to about 26th or 25th of late. And so I think looking for that progress where it's not going to be, they're not going to jump up to a top 15 team. But if they can get into the like 21 range, I think that would be a huge success for this team even if they're losing games, winning games, honestly, the results don't matter to me anymore. Yeah. I mean, I think that that that's been the case for a while now, but now it's, it's confirmed that the results don't matter. I do think that Christian Batista in our chat brings up a a funny point, which crossed my mind is that the ducks are going to get they're They're going to get into that top pick range in the next, however many games. And then everyone's going to come back and they're going to screw it up at the end and fall out of the lottery. Who knows, man? I think what we learned from last year is just just playing for odds isn't necessarily the way to go. Um, you just never yeah, know. You can well, get and, lucky. And the other part of it is that I think with this roster, there's a bit more at play with everyone healthy to at least to have buy-in, to understand Cronin's system, and for him to be able to make the adjustments to the roster, right? Yeah. And I think that's more important than finishing with the best lottery odds possible with this current roster. And where they're at and where they're building to. Also, can we talk about the uh, the fire brown sign on yes. that, that popped up? On Are the you broadcast? gonna? Can can we take credit for that? Can we? I don't Should know. we? I feel like I don't know if that's a good move for us to take credit for that. Probably not. Yeah, you're spot on. Probably not a good idea. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna disassociate with that. Yep. The, good call. Good with call. The, with touting that publicly yep. in a, in a, in an arena. Yep. Good call. Good call. But he's right. <laughs> I mean, is he is he wrong? Is, no. Like, like I, I, I look at this I look at this power play and I'll give Newell Brown a little bit of credit. I think that the power play against the Rangers, particularly and again, a lot of his personnel based, right? But Leo Carlson with McTavish, Terry, Sam Carrick, question mark, and Jackson Lacombe, they had some good moments and the problem, and they, they were doing some interesting things, you know, kind of changing sides off the puck, creating these interesting looks. The, the problem remains, is and always will be with Neil Brown, is that why are we, like, the power play two just needs to be playing less, far less. Um, and I know that power play one still plays more than power play two, but it's just, it's got to be even more. I, I just really think that it's such a drastic drop off. And I'm tired of really talking about it, but yeah, we talked about I, it a lot. Thought, thought I'd bring it up. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Fire Brown. It, How many fan bases are like calling to fire a, an assistant? An assistant coach. coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, uh, it, it's not good. So uh, good. we we've talked about it at length, though that that Newell Brown, it, it, it's not going well right now, nope. and and I think. I remember when he was hired, there was actually an article about uh, the Vancouver Canucks power play. He's forward thinking. No, it wasn't that actually. 
it was one that was more critical and more negative. And I didn't know what to make of it. And I was curious how it was going to play out. But it was talking about the fact how he became so predictable with the Quinn Hughes to Elias Pettersson one-timer. Yeah. And that was what he was always looking for and always looking for and always looking for. And it's fascinating. Even now, you, that's what they look for. They look for when McTavish is out there, the pass from the point over to him for a one-timer. When Z, like They're always looking for that one-timer from the half wall. I think that, it's a little. I think it's a little more varied when they have Leo Carlson out there, because like, because like McTavish will change sides within within a shift. It's on the it's still board. the primary look. I think they they want to. Get I don't think out. that's a bad thing though. I think that you need okay. to have you need to have a bread and butter. Like you need to have something that you're kind of building around. Okay. And, that, and I mean Mason McTavish just scored off of that. By the way, that's fair. Um. Also Troy Terry, I want to give him flowers because he's been so uh, good in that left face off circle as a right handed shot. You don't really often see this. Like I can't really think of many examples, but as a left, as a right-handed shooter on the left side, on the left face-off circle, on his off wing, he's actually been really good at getting that pass through the slot and over to the other face-off circle, getting it across the box. Mm-hmm. I mean, the 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 play he made over to McTavish against the Sharks. Granted, Sharks caveat, but he was doing that against the Rangers too. Like he's just. Troy Terry's playing at, at his peak right now. I it's think... re- it's it's really cool to see him like adding layers to his game because I've never he wasn't doing that prior to the mm-hmm. season. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. And I think one thing he's doing really well is off the rush with Leo Carlson and the way they're reading off of each other and to <laughs> yeah, just the give... goal, the goal, the, Henrique's second goal where they they were just like tapping yeah. back and forth to each other. Henrique's just there to like clean up the mess. That's essentially what Henrique is there to do. <laughs> He's doing a good job of it and he deserves credit for it. And we should probably as we're talking about Henrique move to this of uh trade values going uh, uh out of the roof up to the sky for Adam Henrique through the roof. Through the roof. There we go. I don't know why I was struggling so hard there trying yeah. to think think of that, but yeah. Um you have to trade him, right? Well, Yes. Yep. <laughs> like he's a he's a pending free agent. Yep. Um he's 33. Yep. Like he has that modified no trade, you know, 10 team no trade list. I that's not a huge kind of like barrier to trading him. I would be I mean in a way it's a bummer because Adam Henrique is a, you know, good veteran, seems to be well liked, you know, is a good player, but just kind of bad timing in Anaheim. Like just kind of came in at the at the very tail end of of the Ducks kind of contending window or playoff window, and has just kind of been stuck on these rebuilding teams. But it is what it is, you know. But, send him, send him to a great spot. Send him to a Colorado, what have you, and and he'll let him go chase the Stanley Cup. Let me ask you this: If you were to if the Ducks trade him, which they should do, yeah, um, which they will. Like I'm not even they yeah. Will. They do will. you do you would you be open to bringing him back in the off season on a cheap deal if he's willing to come back? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what he's... one or two year two million dollars a year deal. Sure, I mean at that price, sure. That that's what I'm talking about, like a cheaper deal. Something but I don't. Like that. I don't think he's gonna. I don't Fair. think that's what he's. I mean, he's he has 14 goals this season. Yeah, he scored 22 last year. Like he's gonna he's gonna go get a, a nice little contract for himself. I think. Yeah, probably. You're probably right. I was just thinking age, but then again, I mean, it's up to him though. Like, if he wants to come back and kind of just stay in the area, like I don't know. But yeah, I think. I mean, if he's willing to do that, I would be open to it. I would not give him the Alex Kalorn contract. Well, he's not getting it. Like, he's not like like Alex Kalorn didn't necessarily deserve that exact dollar figure, but he was going to get a payday just with his kind of resume. Yeah. Um, But my thing with Henrique is, it's just as much as like I respect what he's done and all that. I just think that the ducks need more mobility (laughs) to put it kindly. They need more speed. They need more playmaking in their top six. And like Adam Henry just isn't that. So I would agree. All right. Anything else that you want to touch on before we start getting into questions? Question time. All right. So we're going to start with our discord, go to patreoncom slash crash bond. We're at the two. If you're at the $2 tier, you get access uh, to our Patreon exclusive discord it's such a fun time in there. Please go check it out and you get access to the channel where we prioritize the questions uh, for this podcast. So uh, Fire Newell Brown drum, bang, drum Banger said, is this team firmly in, firmly in the Cele- Celebi hunt? I think that's for Celebrini. Um, and what happened to, whatever happened to 500? Well, injuries, one. Yep. Injuries really hurt. 
Injuries really, really hurt. Like we've talked about with just this team's struggles, the the some of the coaching issues, but also just like they are still a rebuilding team. Call it what you will, but they are still a rebuilding team. But yes, they are firmly in the Celebrini hunt now. All in, all in for Macklin. Yep. Salem has decided to jump on my lap, so she's here now. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think what what happened to 500, I think injuries really, really derailed it. I think you're starting to see better play overall, but I mean, the Sharks game, granted Sharks, but they played well in that game. I think overall they deserved a much better result. We didn't talk about it too much, but John Gibson, I think, had a rough game in that, that one and really kind of put him behind the eight ball. But I think if whatever happened to 500 injuries, it feels like every step of the way, someone's gotten healthy and then someone's gotten hurt. Like, yep. uh, and now Salem is pushing on my microphone. So you're hearing purring. Uh, but uh, what was it? Drysdale got hurt. Carlson comes back. Uh, Drysdale comes back. Drysdale and Zegris come back. Carlson goes out. Carlson's about to return. Zegris and M- Minchikov go out. Like, it just feels like this team has never been healthy for the entire year. And that's not even considering Alex Kalorn being out for the beginning of the season. Max Jones being out now at different at the, uh, different points of time. Gudis being in and out. Uh, and now you have Labushkin out. Like, it just feels like every step of the way there's been injuries. That's going to happen. But it just feels like this year is above and beyond what you typically see from higher end players um, on a roster. And just it, so I, I would say that's probably it. Um, I would say, yeah, they're in this uh, Celebrini hunt. Um, I think any team in the top five is going to be there. Um, and then he also asked, is Sam Carrick the new Derek Grant? No, he's not that bad. Come no. on. I, yeah. Like, I, I think you can have arguments of why is he out there in a six on five situation? That's not why his fault, he, though. No. He's and also, also face offs. <laughs> I also think if he's going to be the net front guy, like, I think there's an argument for it. Like, he scored goals in the AHL. Like, he was a point producer there. Like, I think you could do worse than having him as your net front guy there and then letting everyone else do the work. My main issue was when he was out on the six on five and Kalorn was net front and Carrick was in the, in the bumper position. Like that is an issue where he should be nowhere near the bumper position. He's just not going to give you the value you need there and create offense enough. Um, but yeah, I, I think Carrick's better than, than Derek Grant. Um, Appa and shadow said Lacombe's ELC is up at the end of the season. What is his next contract? Like, probably a bridge deal I yeah mean, i think he's not getting an eight-year deal I'll my bet is like now. three times like 1.5 yeah something to that effect yeah and then eventually uh, traded just kidding stop uh chubb says what do you guys think is a realistic return for vetrano and henrique well so i think henrique probably gets you like a second round pick at this point and, it just a, a, and a, depends and on if there's a bidding war but most likely yes second round pick maybe a prospect with that yeah, but for Toronto probably gets you a first round pick and more and more. Here's what I'm curious about: okay. Pack- packaging those two together. Yeah, that could be intriguing for for one of these contending teams. Would you retain on Vetrano? Yes, with it being for next year also. Yes, I mean okay. it's not a huge cap saving, but for a cap strapped contender, could be a could be more valuable. So yeah, yep. Uh, Goose said, who's more likely to see NHL time this year, Tyson Hines or Sasha Pasterjob? <laughs> wow, what a question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll go Tyson Hines. Uh, Doom Grouser said, what lessons can the Ducks learn from other teams who are struggling to exit their rebuild? Senator Habs, Sabres. Why are the Habs in that? <laughs> I don't know. I'm and, just... And why, why, did, I'm, why, did, why did this question get a bunch of, like, upvotes? I don't know. Okay, well... I don't think the Habs are struggling to exit their rebuild. Like they're still on the they're still on the cutting room floor. They're still like barely out of, like starting to rebuild. So take them out of there. Senator Sabres though is an interesting one. I don't have a great answer because I haven't followed those teams that closely this year, but I think it just takes time. Like it's just hard to to go from well a, coll- a collection of young talent with some decent veterans to all of a sudden like playoff caliber. It's it's a hard corner to turn. And I, th- I think I think a big part of it is finding the right guys to make trades for, to help address your weakness, right? Yeah. I think one of the issues for the Sabres, right, is they gave out a lot of money and a lot of term to guys that really didn't deserve it. And you can maybe say Alex Kalorn is in that wait, mold. Wait, who are we um, talking about for the Sabres? The Sabres. Uh, Oposo. Okay. And Jeff Skinner, actually. Yeah, but are those – I don't think that's what's like – Th- I just that think, should, well, that they, shouldn't be the difference. No, but they didn't. They didn't. They didn't do the build part of it well. Like 
they did the like break down the tear down, getting the Jack Eichels, getting the Rasmus Dahlins. I mean, hell, they've had two straight, two first overall picks in Dahlin and, and Power on this team. They've traded Jack Eichel now for a really good ransom of, of players, and they still can't really make it through and break it through. I think you really have to identify the right players for your team. And it's the building part and capitalizing on those when you get the chance. And even if you have to overpay with assets, you overpay to get the right players. Yeah. As in, and so not overpay in terms of like free agent salaries, but in terms of trades. Um, all right. So let's see. Uh, Doom Grouser all said, do the struggles of the teams make you real reevaluate the project projected timeline uh, for the Ducks to be playoff contenders? Yes. The, the the short yeah. answer is, the short answer is yes. The more nuanced answer is I just don't think you can put a number on it. Like you just have to keep building the team, keep building it to be more competitive. But the team will go as the young core progresses. That's just the bottom line. It also will go as the coach optimizes his tactics to those players. But I just don't think you can put a number on it. Quite yeah. quite quite honestly. Yeah, I, I mean, I previously was their playoff team next year. Now, I still think that can happen, but I'm not as... Can't expect it. Because yeah. Buffalo, everyone, Buffalo is everyone's slam dunk. They're they're going to make it now. They had, the, they had the, the year of the flashes. Now they're in. And once you know it, the hockey gods were like, not so fast. It's not linear. Here you go. And I feel like that's just how you have to approach it. Yeah, and Stan uh, said, when will we see OZ? <laughs> People are just clamoring for Olin Zellweger. I don't know. To be honest, I, mean, I don't I don't know. To be honest, I keep checking AHL transactions each day just out of curiosity. Part of it just because I'm, for whatever reason, love this type of stuff and love seeing waiver wires and paper transactions and trying to piece it together with like Robert Haig right now um, and figuring out why he's on waivers. I think it's so that they can protect him from having to go on waivers again. Or not waivers, why he's getting sent down with paper transactions. Uh, Doomcrosser said, any comments from Felix on the Habs 9-4 loss to the Bruins on Saturday? Next question. Okay. Also, uh, also no, it was 5-4 going to the third. I'll leave it at that. Okay. I'll leave it at uh, that. Solani Sandwich said, given all the injuries and the potential trades at the deadline, <laughs> over under 65 points for the season and by how much? Uh, Probably under. What's their pace right now? They have... Uh, let's see. I don't know. I, math is hard right now. They have 31 points in 46 games. That's 31 wrong. and 46 times 82 is 55 point pace. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going under. <laughs> what were they? 59 last year? Something like that. I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over. I'll say over. Everyone gets healthy. They have a good run down the 20 last 20 game stretch. Okay. And they f- get some results that they shouldn't ha- that they should have gotten earlier on in the year. Um, Doctor Plant Plant Wrench PhD Thugonomics said, "When do you think the Ducks trades start happening?" I don't know. I mean, when's the deadline? I think it's March? like end of February, early end March, February? end of February. The Paverbeek will not be the first to to act. You will not be no. the first to pull the trigger. So nope, nope. That, I mean, I mean, have we learned nothing from last year's trade deadline where Paverbeek like? didn't do anything until the last like five minutes. So, yeah, I mean, I wonder if maybe he's learned from that and maybe pounces a little bit earlier. If he gets a deal that he likes March 8th is, uh, the deadline is what our uh, Steve Hitchigian Mar- and, March and 8th, saying. March 8th at, uh, 1159 AM is when okay. we start seeing the trades. Okay. Uh, co-champion bastard said, what's your opinion on Jack Kobaka's tape job? None. Okay. Uh, Olaf is berserker said, in your opinion, is Merzlikens trade request good, bad, or neutral for John Gibson's market? Neutral. Yeah, neutral. I think Gibson's better than him. I don't know if it really affects it that much. I mean, what are we doing here? Yeah. Isaac said, imaginary scenario. The Ducks say they intend to move Henrik Vitrano Labushkin before the deadline. What are two teams for each that phone for Beek and a possible return from each of them? Hopeful or grounded returns? <laughs> Uh, we're we're, we're going to get the version of this question okay. like every podcast until Seriously. the deadline. Henrique, I will go New Jersey and Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Colorado, I, maybe. Colorado, sure. Returns, let's just go first in a prospect. Or sorry, Henrique. Henrique, sorry, Henrique, second in a prospect. Okay. Uh, Vetrano, Vetrano, I think Vancouver could be an interesting one, but I don't. 
Vancouver actually makes more sense sense for for Vetrano than Henrique because I think they want someone with term. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think Vetrano to Vancouver and let's change Henrique to Colorado and New Jersey. Vetrano to Vancouver and Florida. We'll do that. Okay. Uh, first in a prospect, Labushkin. I will go Toronto. Third, fourth. Yeah, if they can get a third for him, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, and then where else for Labushkin? Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry. That that's the best we got, Isaac. Uh, still There's, growing into that school. Time. Said a lot of successful teams have an identity. What is your ideal identity or brand of hockey uh, for the Ducks from a competitive standpoint? Personally, I want an up tempo team. They're going to give up some chances to, uh, against, but I want a team that's going to play a bit of a run and gun style, going to create offense, going to make it a high scoring, entertaining game. That That's what I want a team that is going to not be afraid to essentially uh, impact the game and understand that they are going out there to go and score goals. Like that is maybe not a uh very uh popular system in the nhl but it's one that i personally would like the most because it's one that's about entertainment for the fans so the identity for me is just play tailor your tactics tailor your team to your players to your best players like honestly like what like sometimes you just gotta you you just gotta go with what you have well this and this I, is and i think sorry, right man. and right now the ducks are trying to be this kind of hard to play against physical team. I think you can be just as hard to play against by just playing this kind of up tempo, creative playmaking style instead of trying to just, you know, smash guys through the glass on the four check. So I think this is ignoring guys on the roster and just what you would ideally want from your team. I mean, kind of what I just said. <laughs> okay. I still, I, I would still rather see that than the way they're trying to play right now. Okay. Uh, Olali 17 said to the ducks look to trade Gibson before there's an announcement of about expansion. If there's an expansion draft before his contract is up, seems like he'd lose even more value. Once teams know that the ducks have to move him to keep Dostal. man, that's a great point. That's crazy that we're at this point. <laughs> that's a, that's a fantastic point. Uh, I'll go with yes. Although, although do you really I'll, want to end up having to expose Dostal? No, I think you expose Gibson because I don't think they would want to take on that salary cap. Eh, I mean, he's got three years left. Like it's, it's not, a, well, it depends on when bad. it depends on when the expansion draft would happen. Also, we've seen expansion teams take, I mean, the, the golden Knights taking Mark Andre Fleury, for That's example, true. like you kind of want someone to build your brand around. That's a great point. I don't know That's if John Gibson point. is that, but you you would expose Gibson, but I think there is the argument that O'Lally's making, which is I think reduce, O'Lally it, is it would right reduce his value. You trade him before, trade him before you lose that that leverage. Yep. Uh, Fire Newell Brown drum banger banger is saying is Felix calling for Cronin's dismissal? No, because I think I think Cronin is capable of seeing what's going wrong because he literally said it. But it's like now I'm waiting for the adjustment. Yeah. Shocking 911 said, assuming players were the same cost, who would you rather have next season, Henrique or Kalorn? Kalorn. Yeah. Agreed. No questions asked. Uh, OG Leo Carlson Truth, who said, training camp begin uh, for the 2025 2026 season has begun. Is Greg Cronin still the bench boss of Felix's Anaheim Ducks? Uh, do I have to answer this? I don't know. It's your uh, it's like, a question for you. We can move on. I'll just say yes. Okay. I'll go with yes. Goose said, is Fowler's decline more age-wise or system fit-wise? I think usage. I think it's, yeah. It's, again, this goes back to Cronin, right? I think why usage he, by Cronin. Why is he playing almost 30 minutes a game? Why is he playing in all situations? Because I think there's still pockets of the games where he looks fine, or he where he even makes good plays. It's mm-hmm. just when you're playing that much and you're being asked to play the way that they are, it's just going to, it's not going to end well. Like, I think he's been solid enough defensively overall, but when you're playing that much, you're going to have breakdowns. That's just how it's going to work when you're playing. Those like if you have minutes. an old and, car, you don't drive all the time going a hundred miles well, an hour. You're, you're just, when you have that much time on ice, you're going to give up some chances against. And I think that from a perspective, a perspective side of it, I think, Fans are going to see that and think you're playing poor because of that. Well, this also I, this also goes back to the forecheck though, because 
with this bad four check, the, the D's are ha- are ending up having to defend a lot more of these yep. rushes too. That's fair. That's a good so. point. Um, is there any? And Goose said, "Is there anybody we can give flowers to this week, or is the garden burned?" I mean, give it, <laughs> give it, give it to, give them to the Carlson line, give them to the Silverberg line, give them to Gudis. I think Mason go. McTavish is he's trying. I mean, he scored a goal, like for crying out loud. He scored a goal against the... Uh, I would not give him flowers. I think I think especially against the Rangers, I thought he had one of his like better games of late. I huge, would huge dis- emphasis on... I, I would disagree there, but okay. I mean, the, um, I mean, consider where the bar is. <laughs> fair. I still would disagree, but f- okay. Uh, Goose said, is Robert Haig equal to or worse than Simon Benoit? I think he's fine. I don't really, I don't really see the the glaring deficiencies that no. others do. I thought he was fine last night. I think there are things foot speed wise that he doesn't necessarily have. I mean, he is but, what he is. He's a seventh defenseman, and I would say he actually surprised me a little bit in the offensive zone. I think oh, the, he had a, the, the pass he had to Silverberg. Uh, wasn't the, it Leeson where it was like a shot? Oh, yes, up. it was. It was Leeson. Yeah, it was Leeson where he kind of found the soft space and then recognized Leeson was driving and made that really nice pass to him. Yep. That was one. There was another rush in the third period where he jumped Simon, up. And to Simon the play. Benoit could literally never do that. So, yeah. like, I, I think Robert Haig is better than. I think he's a bit overhated right now. He's a seventh defenseman. Uh, we just got a new question. Who is more hated in the CTP Discord? Frank Saravalli, Mason McTavish, or Jacob Truva? Truva. Definitely Saravalli. No questions asked. I mean, we don't actually hate Mason McTavish. Well, I'll, no. I'll just leave it at that. No. Well, it's not the. It's the Discord. It's not just you and me. Oh. Well, I can only speak for myself. Okay. Um, all right. We're going to move on to, I got a question from Twitter, then we'll get to Twitch and YouTube. So please, if you're in Twitch and YouTube, start throwing the questions in there with question uh, ahead of it, just for ease for me to find. If you posted one earlier, please repost it just to make my life a little bit easier here. But I got this one from Hockey South saying, hey, Jake, another adventurous week for the Ducks. This team still needs a bit of a ro- bit of roster help, I'd say, to be in the playoff mix next year. If Carolina was a trade, no- trade partner, What's a real, realistic exchange that makes both teams better? Appreciate you guys. Go for it. Ah, thanks. Uh, I think Frank Vitrano actually brings a shooting talent that they don't necessarily have on their roster and on that team can be actually really effective and kind of fits in some ways also what they have, which is guys that just like to shoot. So I'll go with Frank Vitrano. And coming back, uh, let's go with a first-round pick, and I don't know their prospect system that well. Yeah, I'm like looking Ryan Suzuki, Noel Gunler. Yeah, I don't Let's know that. that. No, no Gunler. Give okay. me Noel Gunler. Uh, Trevor Zebra said, if you guys are taking questions, and I have a couple. If the Ducks land at second overall. Who would you like them to take? I have not done my draft prep yet. I'll let you take the second floors. overall. Yeah. Um, so I, I need to refresh myself on who I think they will. Because t- I, I always do this thing of like who I think they will take versus who I would take. I think Hayden Lindstrom fits a lot of what the Ducks are trying to do. Just that kind of like that physical attributes plus skill. Um, Maybe Lindstrom. I mean, I'm not like a draft expert either. Lindstrom or just go go crazy and go Ivan Demidov. But I'd go Lindstrom. I think he makes the most sense for what they need. Okay. And then he also asked about realistic return for Henrique at first, and we've kind of answered that second in a pick. Ooh, Bradley um, Nadeau from the uh, from the Hurricanes would be nice to get. Okay. Yeah. There it is. Uh, so we got this question from Daniel Me in the uh, YouTube chat, and so I should bring this up. Uh, we are now going to move over to the Twitch chat and YouTube chat. If you're listening on your favorite podcast services, you can be uh, you can help support us at twitch.tv slash crash pond, where if you have Amazon Prime, you get one free Twitch Prime gaming sub each and every month. You do have to hit subscribe after 30 days. It does help out more than you can imagine. You can be just like, and I forgot to read these last episode, uh, Crash the Net. You can be just like the Puff, and you can be just like Briggs Wellman. Uh, you get special emails in the chat, special badges, extra name, or if you just follow us there, you'll get notified when we go live. Or you can find us at youtube.com slash crash pond. And if you have a YouTube account, and yes, I know all of you do, find us there. Subscribe to our channel, like our videos. If you subscribe to the channel, you'll get notified anytime we go live or anytime Felix posts any of his uh, breakdown videos. There was one of Cutter Gauthier from The weekend that came out that was really, really good. Please, everyone, go check that out. You'll get notified when we uh, post some clips from this where if you're listening to the whole podcast, maybe you don't need to watch them. If you want to, still helps out. But 
it's little breakdowns, little clips from the episodes that are, are fun engagement things. So go check us out there at youtube.com slash crash the pond. Did you just admit uh, to engagement farming? I mean, that is what posting clips is. It okay. is just taking our podcast and putting it into sh- much shorter form for Continue. various platforms. Continue. Uh, Daniel Me said, question. So if we decrease Fowler's minutes, who do we have to step up with? No Minchikov and no Jamie. Kind of hard to. So, um, I mean, looking at the minutes last night, Fowler, let me see. Fowler actually did not play the most. Gudis played 25 minutes. Fowler only played 21 minutes, actually. Um, but, like... Hag and Hag played 13 minutes. Mm-hmm. Like, if you just give Hag, and I'm not saying Hag is that great that he really should be getting a lot of minutes, but if you got him up to like 16 minutes, yeah, that that's like three minutes off of Fowler's ice time, and you can just kind of divvy that up. You you spread out one minute to all these different guys, and instead of Fowler getting double shifted, it's now uh, Vakanai and playing a little bit more. Gouda's playing a little bit more. I mean, Lacombe only played 16 minutes last night. Yeah. Like, there's a reason why most teams don't have a defenseman playing 25 to 30 minutes. And it's because typically the minutes are divvied up pretty evenly uh, with the top four playing more than the bottom pairing, but it's divvied up pretty evenly. And so the Fowler is just getting double shifted and playing with different partners. He's playing in all situations. Like, take him off the power play. That will also help. Like, he is, he's just essentially being told to shoot the puck from the point and it's just going right into shins going the other way. It's not being effective in that situation. His offensive awareness is like some of the worst I've ever seen. It's it's bad this year. Like that is the biggest critique of him this season is the offensive yeah. zone type of stuff in the power play. So, um, so yeah. So he he definitely should be be uh, playing less, and you can just divvy up those minutes more. You give each guy a minute more. That takes four minute or that takes five minutes off his ice time. Um, and so Elizabeth Leo said, uh, question, Torts said that Dryzo reminds him of Eric Carlson. I've also heard people compare him to Makar and saying the Ducks made a big mistake trading him. What are your thoughts on this? <laughs> the floor is yours. Just give it time. Give it what time. Are your th- give, give us your thoughts. I mean, I think it's... Like, I think Jamie Drysdale's a, a good player. Mm-hmm. Potentially could be a great player. I don't understand the Eric Carlson comparison in any way they just don't play the game same at all they don't move the same they don't like there's just nothing about them that's similar except that they both play hockey in the nhl like that's where both right hand defensemen like that's where the similarities end um but yeah i don't i just feel bad for jamie because they're putting a lot of pressure on him by making all these comparisons and I just know from the, from what I've seen and Hey, maybe it'll change now in a, in a better environment, you know, like with a better team that maybe it'll come to fruition, but I just don't think he's going to live up to that. I don't think, I don't know how many players really can. And I just feel like he's being set up to fail. I mean, it feels, it honestly feels like the, he's just 19. I hope it doesn't all over again. I hope it doesn't happen. Like I hope he lives up to all of it, but it just, again, from what I've seen of him, and I could be totally wrong. Maybe he'll really break out, but it just doesn't feel like it's going to go that way. Yeah, I, I think it, it feels like kind of the second year for for Drysdale where he was not good. And it feels like a lot of people were glossing over it, saying that he's just 19 and that he'll develop. And it's just setting up. Well, this is worse. <laughs> this no, is I, worse. Yeah, but it feels like in the same vein of setting up for for failure by doing that, by making these these comparisons or or assessments that aren't necessarily realistic yeah. um all right alex olvera said question any interest in kuzmenko 39 goals last year on the outs outs publicly contract up at the end of next year probably won't score probably uh won't score 40 again but could add some scoring on a bargain so kuzmenko by the way has a modified 12 team no trade list uh making five and a half mil aav this year and next and his ufa at the end of it uh, I don't know. I honestly don't really know enough about him to, to He's really 27, say. about to be 28. Yeah. Like I see his contract and his like box score stuff, but I don't know. I mean, could he help the ducks from the little I've seen of him? Sure. But is he, a I, guy, is he a guy you want to spend assets to get? Yep. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know if I would L- give him L- assets low, for some... low upside. Well, low upside. And like the only way I would do it is if there was an extension in place. And if I haven't dove into his numbers, 
But if there was an extension in place, because then you feel better about trading some assets for a guy. But even then, he's still not going to necessarily align with your window. Yep. So uh, don't see any more questions right now. Throw them in if you've got them. But we'll move on to the shit show questions that we've got. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Dr. Plant Wrench, PhD Thugonomics. <laughs> do you uh, have to say the whole thing each time? It, yes, I do. It, okay. It's contractually obligated here. Okay. Uh, what is the ideal thermostat setting for winter? For winter? I don't know. I don't think about that. 69. Okay. No, 69 is a little hot. Uh, I'll go I'll go if it's middle of the day and it's cold. 69 degrees is nice because it kind of warms it up a decent amount, makes it feel a little bit better. I'd say nighttime, 65 degrees. I think under 65 is when it starts getting too cold in the house. Okay. So we'll go with that. Um, let's see, Elizabeth Leo, and this is a non shit show question or a YouTube chat said question. I'm not sure if the ducks would do this this season, but would you be interested in seeing a power play of Leo Mason, Trevor cutter and Pavel? Yes. Yes. I think that's the plan that that's what it should <laughs> like. That's what it should be. I think that that's where this is all headed. Yes. Uh, Dr. Plant wrench back to shit show questions. <laughs> Dr. Plant wrench, PhD thugonomics said, would you rather your team sign Snell or Bellinger to a $200 million contract? I don't know. I don't know. Not a baseball guy. This is shit show, not baseball. Yeah. God. Bad question. Uh, Lamar Jackson's number one fan. Say nice things about Lamar Jackson and his Baltimore Ravens. So I just want (laughs) to let everyone in on the joke. So our good friend Lou, who we bring up all the time on the podcast, he absolutely despises the Baltimore Ravens. Mm -hmm. And he also despises the Kansas City Chiefs because he's a bitter Raiders fan. Yeah, that that is this is a bit because of how much he hates the the Chiefs. This is but not he, about the Ravens. Correct. And so he's kind of built his entire season Mid-mar. football season on how Lamar Jackson is overrated, doesn't deserve the MVP. Just basically like he calls him Midmar, like the word <laughs> mid as in not good. Um and so now he's turned himself, he's turned his whole profile in our Discord, changed the profile picture to Lamar Jackson wearing sunglasses, changed the screen name to Lamar Jackson's number one fan. And all of this is meant, I think, to reverse jinx the Baltimore Ravens and get them to lose. Wow. So you don't think it's about the Chiefs. You think it's about the... I think, the... I think, I think he would rather see the Chiefs beat... I think this season for Lou Wait, is about... Are you actually being serious here or making a joke? Based on what he said in, in our football talk, I think he he would rather see Lamar Jackson's MVP candidacy take a hit then like he wants to see that more than he wants to see the chiefs lose. I, I disagree. I think I've not paid attention. That I mean, much ask him, to, but ask him. I, I mean, he said it, it's the chiefs. It's how much he hates the chiefs. This is not a reverse. Did he, situation. he he said that. Uh, oh, well, if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong, but either yeah. way he hates both teams. Yeah. He's saying it's a hundred percent about the Yeah. And it's also about Taylor Swift and how much he hates that. Okay. Whole. The, okay. There's so much there. So, so either way, this take is just an awful one. Yeah. It's just an awful one. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Me said question. So if you could create a good uh, mixed lineup, where would you break up uh, the McTavish line and what would the lineup be? I think putting that's for you because that's your I, idea. I, I think putting Silverberg there with uh, instead of Strom, I think does something for you. I think Strom with Lundestrom and leasing can still be something. And so it, it's a minor tweak, but one that does help. It keeps Vitrano with McTavish where they can create offense off the rush, which is something they've done well this year. And it allows you to keep boosting Vitrano's trade value. So that's probably an easy tweak that I would make. Yeah. Keep, keep Vitrano with McTavish, but change that right winger. Yeah. I think that that that's an easy swap to make, to make things a bit better. Um, and then, uh, Oh, did you see the videos of Jason Kelsey just being the best? I haven't actually watched them, but I've seen the, the thumbnails and yeah, just, just the absolute best. Just, the most just, re- a, just a gem of a human. Just the the most relatable thing of just taking your shirt off while drinking and just going is it for relatable? It. Is that something you do, Jake? Do you want to let us in on a little secret here? Not no, no comment. No, com- no comment. Okay. Uh, Olaf is berserker said <laughs> pho, pho or ramen ramen for me. I'm not the biggest pho fan. I like them both. This is a hard one. I think if I had to pick like the best possible version of each, I think ramen, but I I really like both. So I'm I'm conflicted. D Rock said, Is a rolled taco simply a taquito for people afraid of culture? 
uh, sure. I don't know what. Am, like, I, I, am I, I missing out on a debate here that I'm not aware of? They're the same thing. Like I've been to places that call them rolled tacos, and some places there's that a lot them. of Mexican places in SoCal that call them rolled tacos. Yeah, I don't see, like I don't, I don't see that in Northern California as much. Which is yeah, I almost feel like taquito is more so the like. It's Seven Eleven. Yeah, I hear taquito. I think Seven Eleven. Like I think rolled taco might be the better. I don't know. Maybe who knows? It could not yeah. be. It's also oh, saying no. rolled, which is not Spanish. So there's that part of it. Uh, let's see. Uh, OG Leo Carlson truther said, "Construct a full starting lineup of CTP folks to win a game seven. Three forwards, two defensemen, and a goalie to win a game seven of what? I don't hockey? know. I don't know. Connor's in our, Connor, you're in our chat. So tell us what what, it, what, what what sport are we trying to win at here? Uh, yeah, I street, not quite sure. Hockey. I think he also just wanted us to divide the the chat by putting yeah, our favorites. I feel like this is about like creating division. Yeah. I Let's just I say I will I put ev- every oh, and full NHL starting lineup of yeah. That's still the, to win a game seven. That mix, none of us are playing it. <laughs> none of us. If, are, if that's the case, pa- then we, Patrick. We can, Patrick. Patrick's can, the only one. How many people are in a Discord server? A hundred something. Oh yeah, well over a hundred. We could all be on the ice. All of us at the same time against the Colorado Avalanche, and still get blown out by like a hundred goals. Yeah. So it just doesn't matter. I mean, I think Pat's probably the best. Pat and Bob are both good at hockey, so we'll go with that. I mean, I, the, I have the, all the I have all the respect of the world for those two, but yeah. No, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> if, if like if we're trying to like put the people that we know are good at hockey, like those two are for sure in there. The uh, everyone else, I don't know the quality of players, so we'll just go them two on a team by themselves. What about a ball hockey game? Ball hockey game isn't Chris from Late Arrivals get a ball hockey? Oh he's, yeah, he doesn't he's he like play a ball competitive hockey ball hockey player. Yeah, doesn't he come out to SoCal? So, uh, Chris, Chris is our captain. I hate ball and hockey, by the way. I've never played. I used to be in a league. Wow. Yeah, it wasn't. Huh. It was like on a tennis court, so it wasn't. But it was very organized, refs and everything. Shout out, shout out, Chris from Late Arrivals. Shout out, Late Arrivals, as always. Yeah, shout out. <laughs> Anything else? Um, <laughs> stressful weekend as a sports fan. Oh, as you all know, 49ers. Dramatic, thrilling, agonizing, painful. I just kept texting my girlfriend the entire time. I was just like, I'm in pain. I'm in pain. Everything everything sucks, um, but they win. We wait for the Detroit Lions. I'm nervous. Hopefully, all our great listeners will be praying for me. We'll be rooting for the Niners for me, and not rooting against them to spite me. I hope that that's not the path people take. Football mm. is fun. Enjoy football. I watched a little bit of the Bills Chiefs game, and that was it. Enjoy football. This is the best time of year as a football fan. I went and saw well, the wrestling. Well, football I, is the best. I went and saw a wrestling movie during the fourth quarter of that game. I did not watch that game. Full disclosure. Oh, so. okay. But yeah, went and saw Iron Claw. Went on the first, uh, me and my wife's first date night, first movie date night since pre Luke. So, fantastic movie. Oh, I yeah. did want to ask you. Okay. Patrick Waugh. Oh yeah. New York Islanders. Good for hockey for him being back. I mean the. You know, I think that we need to kind of move away from like just, yes, he was, he had a very interesting tenure in Colorado, but that was a while ago. And yes, he fucked up with it also. Like the way he left was like put them in a hole. But that's what he does. Yeah. That's what he does. Remember how he got traded from Montreal? True. Walked up to the owner in a game. True. (laughs) That's just what he does. But uh, I hate that it's the Islanders. I'm not going to lie. That roster is just. Lane Lambert, not a good coach, but also like I look at that roster and like remember you when know, the Ducks almost hired Lane Lambert? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like giving Pierre Engvall a seven-year contract at three billion a year, like just yep. it's such a weird roster. But I want to I want to see it work. I want Patrick Waugh to to you know get back to, to his winning ways. But also, what's hilarious is that I don't know. if people who follow junior hockey or not, but like he's had a giant beard the last few years. And I got, I really got used to seeing him with the beard beard's gone now. So he's, he's bought in. 
Was he clean shaven completely? I thought I saw the thing. Yeah. And he still had a beard. No, he just wasn't clean. big. No, he's clean shaven. Wow, Lou got to him. Yeah, yeah. That's a shame. Well, I, here's what I will say though. Now this is a bit of a tangent, but. I feel like if there's anyone in hockey who can actually like stand up to Lou Lamorello and oh, yeah. tell him what to do, it's Patrick Waugh. Well, so, it's not even tell him what to do. It's just the not going to take shit and he will leave. Yeah. yeah like if like th- if there's one ego that's bigger than Lou Lamorello, <laughs> yeah. it's number 33. Yeah. So, Agreed. I'm, so. I'm, is it weird? I'm going to like root for the Islanders now a little bit. Oh, I'm not rooting for them, but I'll watch them. I want to see it. I want to see it work. Yeah. It's good so, for the sport. Yep. All right. I think that's going to do it for tonight, though. On that note, thank you for listening, everyone. If you want to support the podcast, the number one way is to go check out our Patreon page. Uh, for two bucks a month, you get access to our patrons only Discord server. Uh, this is where you get to interact with other diehard Ducks fans, keep up to date. It's honestly the best way to keep up to date with the Ducks, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the easiest way. And then for $7.50 a month, you get that. You get two bonus podcasts. We just did one on the trade deadline. So a good trade deadline kind of preview, tune up, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then on top of that, you get also exclusive player breakdown videos. So go check that out. Patreon.com slash crash the pond. Um, you can also subscribe to us on Apple podcasts, leave us a rating and a review. We greatly, greatly appreciate that. It helps out the show tremendously. Also, you can leave us feedback and subscribe on Spotify. If you are a Spotify user like myself, uh, it's totally fine. You can help us out over there as well. You can you can also subscribe to us on YouTube. We've got videos going up, player breakdowns. We've got clips of the podcast. So if you want the podcast kind of shorts in bite-sized form, you can check it out that way. You can also go combat some just awful takes in the comments. So if you want to if you want to help us out and combat some truly, you know, pe- people that Flyers are Flyers fans, people that are not you know fans of the podcast uh, or Flyers fans, just infiltrate the comments and leave just some horrendous takes, especially the ones that have to do with cutter goche. So go fight the good fight. Uh, that's at <laughs> youtube.com slash crash the pond. Uh, there's a couple of videos up right now of cutter goche. So if you want to familiarize yourself with his game, great way to do that. Um, so go check that out. You can also follow us on social media. We are on Twitter. Is it, is it starting to get a little bad to say Twitter? No. It's been long enough. No, it's still Twitter. I'm, I'm never changing the logos on this podcast. I never <laughs> stop. I'm never going to say it's X. It's Twitter. Okay. It's Twitter. Go follow us there. We are there. We are active. Uh, it's a kind of an easy way to keep up with everything that's going on at the podcast. Uh, go to crashthepond.com slash shop. Get yourself a Anaheim Vibes t-shirt. Hey, we're, we're both, both wearing, wearing the same it. shirt. Is this a Spider-Man meme? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but go check that out. The... The Anaheim Ducks are still vibes HC as far as I'm concerned. We still get to watch Leo Carlson and Troy Terry do their do their thing, work their magic. We get to watch Mason McTavish grow. There's still a lot to be excited about despite the season kind of losing a certain luster, but it's still something worth following. We'll be there with you the entire way. Thank you for listening, everyone, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.